Hey everyone, uh, as you might notice, this is not a talk about Rust in translation. Uh, it's cool because it does say that on the schedule. Um, I'm gonna what, pull in audible, is that like a sports thing? Yeah. All right, cool, something like that. And, and we're gone. Hopefully we'll be back up in a second. Is everyone having a good time at Rust Belt Rust? Yeah, um, I am extremely excited that uh, Carol and Jake and the entire team decided to throw this. Uh, they're some of my favorite people and I like coming to Pittsburgh a lot. Uh, so, what's up with the slides? All right. Um, hi. If the trick is unplugging it and plugging mm -hmm. it back in, I'm going to be pretty sad for myself. All right, we're back. Yay. Woo. Shout out to AV teams. AV is so hard. Um, all right, cool. So uh, I'm actually giving a talk today about uh, Intermezos, uh, which is a teaching operating system, and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, but hi, my name is Ashley Williams. I go by AG Dubs on Twitter. You may know me from that. I don't recommend you follow me on Twitter. I tweet too much. Um, and so I'm a little bit out of my element because uh, I actually work for a company called NPM. Does anyone here know what NPM is? Cool, no left pad jokes, I swear. I'll take you out if you do that. Anyways, uh, I work for a company called NPM. We're a package manager uh, for JavaScript. Uh, I sit on the board of directors of a language called Node.js. Well, it's not really a language, it's a runtime, but again, these are details that don't matter. Um, you could say that I'm a JavaScript person, and I was so glad to hear that conversation about tribalism earlier, because sometimes in the Rust community you hear grumbles about this lovely little language. Uh, but I started out actually as a Rubyist, and the language that I learned right after Ruby was actually Erlang. Uh, in general, you could say that I really, really, really love programming languages so much. Uh, and one of the reasons I like programming languages is because I really like thinking about thinking. Um, I don't have a computer science degree. My degree is in neuroscience and philosophy. Um, but that being said, I do like thinking about the thinking that happens when people write code. And one of the things that this kind of desire of mine has led to is working on this really neat project called Intermezos. And some of you got to be part of our very first workshop yesterday. Uh, but this project actually started um, from a little funny story. But first I'll say Intermezos is a teaching operating system specifically focused on introducing systems programming concepts to people who kind of know a programming language but are not familiar with systems programming. One of the ways that uh, the people who work on it like to describe it is that it's like, okay, you can write some JavaScript, now let's write an operating system. Um, and the way this kind of started was, was sort of interesting. So uh, I started this with someone who will go completely unnamed, uh, but he looks exactly like his Twitter photo, um, which you may or may not have seen. Uh, and he, he was like, hey, do you want to like stay in tonight, put on some comfy pants, and do a neat kernel tutorial? And I was like, oh yeah, heck yes I do. Let's get close to the metal, let's do this. And then I was like, oh wait, wait. Can I write an operating system? Should I write an operating system? Like I was so worried I baked a whole cake. Just kidding, I don't know how to bake a cake. Um, but I was nervous and part of this nervousness was coming from the fact that there's this amazing little website called osdev.org. Has anyone been to this website? Keep your hands up if you were motivated and enthused by it. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna talk to you about a part that made me feel pretty terrible. All right, and it's this page called Required Knowledge, and there's some really, really special parts in this. But just to make sure it's absolutely clear, I think that this page is garbage. Total garbage. So it starts off by saying that you need to have an understanding of basic computer science, which includes 
being intimately familiar with hexadecimal and binary notation. Who here is intimately familiar with hexadecimal notation? All right, there were more people in Germany who felt like they were when I did this the other time, but seriously, you want to intimately familiar? Whatever, I don't know, that is ridiculous. All right, then they went ahead and said with programming experience that learning about programming within operating systems project is considered harmful. All right, let's just do away with considered harmful. That's like not a cool thing to say and doesn't make any sense. Uh, and lastly, they let you know that failure to comply with any of this required knowledge would make you look silly. <laughs> and that's how you know the website is mostly run by 15-year-old boys. Um, I know this because I have at least one confirmed person who is a 15-year-old boy who is really into this website. Um, so yes, failure to comply will make you look silly. I mean, looking silly maybe isn't all that awful, but anyways, this is not a cool idea. I'm not into this at all. And so what's interesting is that when we think about doing developing of operating systems or any systems level programming, there's definitely this social feel that like, this is for the elite programmers. This is not for like, oh, you like write CSS? Definitely don't write an operating system. Stay away, this is not for you. Uh, and that's really goofy. And so to go back to the story when the Intermezzo's project kind of came to its inception was this kernel tutorial. And this kernel tutorial was written by this awesome person named Philip Opperman. And it was a series of blog posts called Writing an Operating System in Rust. Uh, and you can check that out by uh, going to this URL right here. And it was super great. The idea was that anybody can write an operating system. And not only can anyone write one, but they should write one. All right, so I was like, all right, yeah, I can operating system and so can you. This is great, all right, let's do this. So I did. That night we stayed in, worked for like five or six hours and I got this amazing, very, 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 very small operating system that I wrote in Rust. And I was extremely excited to share this. Of course, you see here like, okay, this is an operating system. It looks like you printed hello world to the terminal. And I did. And it is an operating system. <laughs> but there is a good question of like, what, what is operating system, right? Like, what the heck? <laughs> you might be hard pressed to actually kind of define what an operating system is. And it turns out that a lot of people, people who are very respected in operating systems, also struggle with defining it. So there's three definitions that we were able to find. Um, this first one comes from a book called Modern Operating Systems. And they say, it's hard to pin down what an operating system is other than saying it is the software that runs in kernel mode. So that's like a bunch of words that they also haven't defined. So we have no definition so far. Um, and even that is not always true. So no definition that's also not always true. Cool. Um, part of the problem is that operating systems perform two basically unrelated functions providing application programmers a clean, abstract set of resources instead of the messy hardware ones, and then also managing these hardware resources. Okay, so we have something going on with kind of like some abstractions, hardware, the next, but like they're not like really deciding, you know, haven't really said anything for sure. So the next one, very short, a book called Three Easy Pieces, and they say virtualization, concurrency, and persistence. Those are good words. <laughs> Yeah, all right, I still don't understand what an operating system is. And then so here, from something called Exterminate All Operating Systems Abstractions, we see that an operating system is software that securely multiplexes and abstracts physical resources. Wait for it. We believe that the definition specifically, uh, this definition specifically, its view on the operating system as an abstractor of hardware is crippling and wrong. All right, so what's, all right, we don't really have a, de a definition. What's going on? So in, in the Intermezzo's book, we have to deal with this question. And so we define it like this. And so, of course, a bunch of the people who we just read, their definitions kind of say this is wrong. But we say an operating system is a program that provides a platform for other programs. It provides mainly two things to these programs abstractions and isolation. And abstractions and isolation kind of work as two sides of the same piece of paper here. And so then the question is kind of like, well, abstractions, isn't that what we're doing all the time in computer science? Maybe it's what we're doing all the time always?
But what kinds of operating uh, abstractions? So the common abstractions that an operating system is going to provide are going to be things like address spaces, memory protection, processes, files, and sometimes input output devices. So when we looked at my tiny little operating system, what it was doing was just dealing with outputting to the screen. And so yes, it was a very, very small operating system. Um, but there's a kind of neat way of talking about these abstractions and why particularly the abstractions of an operating system are important. So what you can imagine is that you have a program and you want that program to run on hardware A. If you just have hardware A, writing a program just for hardware A isn't all that difficult, but it's also not all that interesting. And it turns out that we have a lot of hardware. So if we want to write a program for hardware A and hardware B, what we need to do is we need to put an abstraction in the middle. And what we see here is that operating system is going to be that exact abstraction. Now, you might also be familiar with the fact that you might want to write programs for more than one operating system. And then what you can see here is we follow the same pattern of abstraction and throw a virtual machine right there in the middle. Now, Again, with the tribalism of languages, perhaps we don't have people who are so fond of Java here, but this is one of the awesome things that Java did with Java's virtual machine. So these abstractions can, while they follow the same kind of pattern, be really important and have huge implications. So we have this kind of generic pattern of how these abstractions work, where we say we have A, and A is explicitly written for X, but I'd really like to support X and Y. And so I'm going to put abstraction B in the middle. All right, so quick break. Uh, if you get anything from this talk, I love throwing this quote in my talks. This is a mathematician named George E. Box. And so we're talking about abstractions, right? And so he has this amazing quote. And he says, remember, all models, or here we can understand the word abstractions, remember all abstractions are wrong. The practical question is, how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? So why am I saying this? I'm saying this is because my favorite definition of operating systems is an operating system's job is to lie. <laughs> All right, it is providing abstractions and it is providing those abstractions and those abstractions are lies. We're gonna tell the program that the program can use all of the memory. There's no other programs out there when it's running a program. I can just believe that. All right, now that's kind of heavy. And so if you're trying to get beginners excited about operating systems, I mean, depending on the type of person, maybe you could be like, we're gonna build a program that's just full of lies. And you're like, let's do it. Um, <laughs> but instead, instead, uh, we went with this word intermezzo, uh, which is a noun that means a light dramatic musical or performance that's inserted between acts of a play. And this was a really great name for a lot of reasons. First off, it, it really played on that idea of abstractions, that the abstractions is what you stick in the middle of something. Uh, but also it's something kind of light. This is a hobby OS, right? We're not actually trying to like rewrite Linux or Unix. We don't want to do that. Um, and so this is the name that we chose for the project. Now, the next question is, right, maybe we kind of have an idea of what an operating system is. What the heck is a kernel? Sometimes people say kernel and they mean operating system, I think, or kernel, op what, what is the difference? All right, so this is definitely a little bit fuzzy. Um, and you hear things like the software that runs in kernel mode, but even that's not always true. The way I use the word kernel is just to mean, this is like the kind of core part of the operating system. So you have an operating system and the kernel is kind of the middle part. And if you have a super, super small one, maybe the middle part is just the whole part. So an operating system or a kernel, I kind of use them interchangeably. And if you'd like to fight with me about that, we can do it in the hallway. Um, all right, so a lot of things, and this has become something that's kind of popular recently, is they're all different types of kernels. So one that you might be familiar with, Unix, is monolithic kernel, but there's also micro kernels and exo kernels and unit kernels and all these different types of kernels. <laughs> I don't know. There's so many types. All right. What's the difference? I don't know. It's whatever someone recently said in Medium. And that joke was so good it broke the AV again. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. I don't know why the AV didn't work anymore. All right. Have you tried plugging it in? Let's see. I do not know. So. How cool is it that it's not raining today? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. Yeah. And we're back. All right, that may or may not be happening every once in a while. So let's get used to it. 
Cool. So again, if you missed any of the important types of kernels, they're all listed here. I did post my slides. Um, please write medium think pieces on all of them. Um, but yeah, OK, all these different types of kernels, all of these white dude actors have no idea what's going on, and probably the people writing kernels don't know what's going on. So a big theme here is that systems programming is supposed to be so official and serious. It's like most of the times we're just kind of making it up as we go. We don't even have like a defined like ontology for how to even talk about these things. All right. So then the next question is, all right, so you're going to build an operating system. What kind of operating system? You know what, gosh, there's a lot of questions here. A lot of questions. And it turns out what kind of operating system? It doesn't matter. All right? We could waste tons of time trying to design this perfect operating system. We could spend time drawing it out, writing all product specs, but we'll never actually build it. And the whole point of the Intermezos project is that you're going in and getting dirty and just trying to figure some stuff out. All right, the goal here is to learn, and it's definitely not to make the best operating system that ever existed. Recently, when we were talking about, like, as we're continuing to build Intermezos out, we're like, oh, maybe we'll do it like any kind of Unix style way. But then recently, we've been talking about, hmm, Futures is out and Rust, that's pretty cool. What if we kind of modeled the, the operating system on, like, V8 and the event loop in Node? That'd be, that'd be pretty neat. And like, is that going to be the best operating system ever? Probably not, but it's probably going to be really interesting. Um, so again, when we talk about what is operating system, finally I was like, gosh, this question, what is it, what is it? And I came up with this, because I'm a huge Carl Sagan fan. So what is operating system? If you wish to computer from scratch, you must first invent the universe. I mean, invent an operating system. The operating system is kind of the universe here. And uh, it's funny because I originally, one of the first talks I ever gave is called, if you wish to learn ES6 from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And I realized last night, I'm pretty sure all the conference talks I've ever given are just slowly becoming the same talk. Um, <laughs> so the whole like, kind of message here that I really want to say is, yes, operating system's cool. Let's do some stuff. But you know, if you want to be an awesome programmer or whatever, you don't have to invent the universe. But that's not really the problem. It's, it's the idea that if you want to, a lot of people tell you you can't. And I want to say no. If you want to invent the universe, you absolutely can. And if you want to, you should. Um, and that's the whole point of Intermezos. So what we're doing here is like, let's make the computer do a thing with like basically nothing else. That's, that's what building an operating system is when we're thinking about the Intermezos project. Um, and as I say, get low. You know, like get low level programming. Yeah? Sorry, I'm trying to delete it. I'm sorry. Um, OK. All right, so let's take a look at what Intermezos actually looks like. So we're going to do some uh, awesome demo time in a second. Uh, but one of the tricky things about building an operating system is there's actually quite a few prerequisites. It's kind of complicated. So what I'll quickly do before we do some demos is talk about kind of getting up and running, what our Linux dependencies are, and some utilities that you can use to help yourself out. Um, and so when I talk about getting up and running, I absolutely love this tweet. This is from a colleague of mine from a few years ago. And he writes, I wonder how many programmers went their entire career without ever getting their development environment working. Anyone in here who still doesn't have their development environment working? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, this stuff is so hard. Uh, I was recently, a, a friend visited uh, me in New York City, and we were kind of talking about the Intermezos project. And he was like, he finally was just like, how do you do that? Like, don't, you're already running an operating system on your computer, so how do you, and it's like, yeah, this is really, really hard. It's kind of even hard to conceive. You don't even know what questions to really ask to figure out what tools. Um, so these are the tools that the Intermezos project uses. Um, there's something called NASM, uh, which is the assembler. There's something called LD, which is the linker. If you're working on a Mac, you have to like use a different linker, and that makes everything difficult. Believe it or not, the Mac operating system is by far the hardest one to get this stuff working on. So for all of its like ease of use for all these other things, it was extremely difficult to get this kind of stuff started. Uh, when I originally was working on Phil Opperman's tutorial, I'm actually listed in his blog post now because I started trying to work build it on my Chromebook Pixel and couldn't forward the graphics. And then I tried to get it up and running on the Mac, and I eventually had to write like a vagrant file for it because it was just completely, completely impossible. Uh, luckily, somebody has written an awesome script that usually can mostly take care of all the things you need. Um, computers, right? How do they work? 
Uh, so after the linker, uh, there's this thing called Grub. This is probably the one thing that you've maybe seen before if you haven't worked in any sort of operating systems development. It's that thing that kind of shows up at the beginning of your, like, I don't know, probably this is like a decade ago. It would show up at the beginning when you're booting up your computer. If, say, you had like a rescue disk in there and then you could select it, it was like blue and white. You knew that you were in trouble if you saw it. Um, yeah. And then uh, after Grub, there's this amazing... I imagine it's XR ISO, but uh, I really like calling it chorizo. Um, so please confirm that I'm 100% correct only. I am not, I don't want to be disabused of this idea. Um, but then finally, the thing that really is what made it click for me as to how are you actually going to develop this operating system is this super awesome thing called Kimu, which depending on what type of operating system you are trying to run on what type of hardware on your computer is either just a virtualizer or an emulator. So it's going to let you be able to build things on, uh, to run operating systems like on a virtual hardware, or you could just, um, you can also emulate different types of hardware, so you can try writing operating systems for those as well. Um, so, and then finally, there's these neat utilities. So something I do have to say about operating systems development, and this is why it's so great that we're able to move so much, so much of our project into Rust, is because when you're not in Rust, the error messages are really, really bad. Like, just fill the screen with a bunch of garbage that does not make any sense. Um, when I first gave this talk, I actually did some assembly live coding and messed up and was able to demonstrate just how terrible those errors are. Um, we won't be live coding assembly today, but Take it from me, the errors are pretty brutal. Uh, but these are uh, two pretty awesome utilities uh, that you can install that will be able to let you kind of inspect the binaries and stuff that you end up uh, creating. And that can be nice. Um, so when we're thinking about building an operating system, we kind of need to understand, all right, what happens when we turn on our computer? Uh, and luckily, we have we, a lot of us, when we're doing development, don't have to think about these things. But in general, what happens is uh, the first step is you have the hardware load something called BIOS, which stands for Basic Input Output Service. All of these names sound like kind of like dystopian generic corporations to me. Um, <laughs> And then BIOS loads GRUB, which I like to think of as like a cute little worm, but it stands for Grand Unified Bootloader, uh, which definitely sounds fascist. Um, <laughs> and then lastly, lastly then, GRUB loads our kernel. All right, and so we've done all of this. Um, and part of the reason this was able to work is because we used that thing called LD to link some stuff together. And so this linking is talking about how sections in input files should be mapped to the output files. This is really, like at least in the way I understand it, like pretty just fancy concatenation. Um, but what's important about this is that it just makes sure that the header info is up at the top so that Grub knows what the heck it's trying to load. Um, and you can understand these headers like similar to the way you think of request and response headers in HTTP. It's really that. It's just giving you some metadata about what you need to do. Um, and so what comes next after that? And so this is a really complicated part, and this is by far the hardest part that we've done in the operating system so far, is jumping into long mode. Does anyone here know what long mode is? All right, cool, we got some people. Um, so when every computer starts up, it originally thinks that it's in 32-bit mode, even though it could potentially be in 64-bit mode. And so every time it starts up, it needs to do this kind of impossible thing, which is like, I think I'm one thing, and I am just going to dive into this impossible thing that I maybe can't do, and then suddenly, oh, I am okay. I could, I could be 64-bit. And uh, when we were doing the workshop yesterday, Steve said, uh, it's very endearing that my computer is willing to jump off a cliff for me every time it turns on. So that's probably the best way to describe what long mode is. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about all these kind of different steps in the operating system. Let's take a look at what Intermezos actually looks like. So may the demo gods be with me. Hopefully we also keep the AV. <laughs> all right, so um, firstly I'll say uh, I've posted uh, all of these slides and the demos to the GitHub and tweeted them out. So if you're interested in playing around with these. Uh, but this is the actual uh, Intermezos code that you can also contribute to. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is just going to load up our bare bones kernel. Um, so we can see in here. This is actually running um, in Rust. So we've written it out in Rust. And we can take a look um, at this. And so what we have right now is here's our k-main, 
And inside this safe block, we have a bunch of these lines. Uh, and so what you can see here pretty much is happening is I'm defining a variable. And this right here is the location on the screen that I want to put something. And then right here is actually uh, a set of characters and color codes in hex. All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like. So I can just run make run right here. I'm going to pop this up. And here is the amazing operating system uh, saying hi to Rust Belt Rust. This is the Doge Woo! operating system. <laughs> I spent so long manipulating those little numbers to try and get, get it. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, so, but fundamentally, like if we take a look at this, uh, that code again, this code is not great. And so, if you want to, you know, I mean, this is basically just like the most technically complex MS Paint ever. Um, like extremely complicated. All I want to do is like put colors and words on the screen, and I'm doing this instead. Um, and so, oh. There we go. It's all right. I know how to fix it. I don't know what's going on. Do I have like an electromagnetic field around me? Oh, uh, I was, I was not hating on MS Paint at all. That was that was all love. Trust me on that. Um, love MS Paint. All right, and we're back. Cool. Um, yes. So again, all I'm doing that is there are definitely ways that we can use Rust uh, to make this abstraction a lot nicer. Um, so let's take a look at that. So one of the last, uh, I guess, systems programming Rust dates that I was on, uh, we uh, decided that we were like, let's, let's write this VGA driver. Um, and let's write it in Rust, and let's test drive it. And the reason that we're able to do this is because the way things are printed to the screen is just memory mapped. So we can kind of abstract this idea of what we're printing onto the screen as a slice. And then we can, all we need to do is take that slice and then just stick it onto the screen and we'll write, write out all of those characters. And so what we did is we abstracted out the VGA driver, which is here. And I'll pull this up here. Um, and so again, this is another Rust project, and we have some tests. And so, like any good show, a little bit of this is pre-baked. Um, but if I run cargo test, all right, we can see you have one failure, and this is this flush method. And what the flush method is going to do is it's going to take um, a slice that we have inside of a struct called VGA. I'll just pop that up here. All right, so we're in here, and we just have this simple struct. Um, we're kind of doing a, a fun thing with uh, generics up there, which I'm not going to explain right now. Uh, but we have this struct where we have this slice um, that is that fun generic. Uh, then we have a buffer, which is just this array of U8s. Uh, and then we have a position. So again, we can kind of see what we saw on that previous screen, where the position is really just where on the screen do we want to start placing something. Um, and then the buffer is going to be that data that we want to write to it. Um, and then uh, the slice is going to be, we're going to take that data in the buffer, and we're going to put it onto the slice. And the slice is going to be how it ends up getting written to the screen. And so the one method that we need to write now is that flush method. So based on what I just told you, right now we're just panicking, um, as one should. We're writing systems code. It's scary. Um, it's not really all that scary. Uh, and so with this flush method, based on the structures that we've already built, all we need to do is say self.slice as mute. Uh, and then we're going to clone from slice. And we're just going to grab that buffer data here. And so writing this, we can just save it. And then I run cargo test. And we're passing. Yay. Um, I have to say, being able to do systems programming in a test-driven way was like kind of awesome. It gives you a lot more security than like when we were originally doing it. And I'll show you some screenshots from that where we're just throwing stuff out there and seeing like, will the computer light on fire? I have no idea. Um, all right. So now that we have our VGA uh, driver working, we can now take this Rust that we've written right here and we can drop it into that bare bones kernel. Um, so let's go back to our bare bones kernel. Here we are. All right, clear this. Um, is this big enough for everyone to see? I tried to guess. All right, cool. Just shout at me if it's not. Um, all right, so in here, we're going to go into our main. 
Oh, oh, CD into, yeah, good job, Ashley. Live coding is scary. All right, so we have all of this fascinating code inside this unsafe block. Um, we're gonna get rid of all of that. Yeah, yeah, deleting code is fun. Um, yay, love deleting code. Um, okay, so now inside this safe block, what we're going to do um, is we're going to use our VGA crate. Uh, so to use that, we're gonna go into our cargo.toml and we're gonna add it as a dependency. Just get rid of that quickly, all right. Um, if you are new to Rust and didn't know that you can just kind of pass something to uh, a path, you can. Pretty neat. So we can just point that to our VGA right there. And then we're also going to need our libc uh, because basically what we're doing with that relationship between the slice and the buffer is just uh, like basically a mem copy. And so that's what we're going to be using here. So we'll add that. And then we'll go back into our main, pull them in. Extern create VGA. All right, and then I'm also going to need to use, um, when we are doing this, we are also implementing the right trait, so I need to make sure that that is in scope. Cool, so we should be ready now to use our VGA crate, of course. Someone out there is being like, I see a typo and it's gonna break. Well, we'll find out. Um, that's what the compiler is for. All right, so in here now, instead of just writing out all of those variables with like the totally indecipherable numbers, um, now we can say something like let VGA equal VGA VGA new. All right, and then what is this going to take? This is gonna to have to take some sort of slice. So we can make our slice here and that slice is going to be kind of this like kind of funky method uh, from raw parts mute. Um, and that's because we really don't have like a lot of stuff um, when we're writing a operating system. Um, so we have to kind of do it from nothing. And so this is gonna take uh, two things. It takes a uh, location and a length. Ah, yes, thank you, that would be brutal. I'd, I'd be so sad, I'd mess it up. All right, so we're gonna give it the location of just the top part of the screen there. Um, I always forget how many zeros I need. It's very complicated. But luckily, we're not doing as many complicated numbers as we were doing before. Um, we're gonna take this as a mute U8. Oh no. All right, I'm making it a little smaller just so we can actually read it across the screen. Uh, and then we're gonna give it that length of 4,000. All right, and so this slice, we should be able to pass to our VGA. And this needs to be mute, I'm pretty sure, yes. All right, so with just this setup, now, instead of having to write all of that stuff that I wrote before, now I can just tell my VGA to write a star. And so what should I have it say? Hello world. Hello world. Witness me. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, that escalated quickly. <laughs> All right. All right, and so I should be able to write this, and then I can say vga.flush. All right. Uh, the reason we do it in these two steps is because we want it to write to the screen all at once and not in some weird incremental way. All right, so assuming that I haven't completely messed up all of this typing, we should be able to now come in here, say make run. Oh, all right, what did I do wrong? Hmm? Uh, I think I did a JavaScript thing, probably. That's usually what happens. Yes. This is not JSON. And this V equals. All right. Woo. And witness me. <laughs> cool. All right. So that was a lot of typing and we did it really fast, but the whole point was to say that when we use Rust in the system development, we can take something that is like kind of really difficult and like fiddly and give ourselves some nice abstractions to work with so that it can be fun. So now it's much easier to take this amazing operating system slash fancy MS Paint and like write all sorts of colors and words to the screen. It's very fun. Um, yeah. All right, so this is actually uh, at the point like we are doing workshops with Intermesos right now, and this is the place that we get to, but the kernel is actually significantly further along. 
Um, and so just quickly, I want to show you, um, I'm getting yelled at, but I want to show you where it's at right now. And so what you can do in the kernel now is you can say, hey, Rust Belt, Rust. Uh, so you can actually type in um, shift doesn't work. So the only thing I can do is this weird like shouty winky face. Um, but yeah, shouty winky face from the kernel. And so this is where the kernel is right now. Um, and if you're interested in playing around with this, we have like quite a few uh, things that you can go, for, go to from here if you want to start playing with that. All right, so that's the end of the demos, and let me wrap it up with some, some quick final thoughts. So one of the key things about Intermezos is that it's not just, oh, let's write an operating system. It's, let's write a book alongside the operating system, and that's pretty intense, so why would you do that? Uh, and this is a, a really cool uh, cartoon that uh, Leslie Lamport talks about in a talk called Writing for Developers, and he says, oh, um, I'm about to read it, so we'll just do that because uh, I don't have any time anymore. Um, but he says, writing is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. And for a very long time, I've kind of reappropriated that. And I also like to say that teaching is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your understanding is. Uh, and so the key point here is that uh, when you're teaching yourself something new, one of the best ways to really understand it is to write it down and then also try and teach it to other people. So I want to encourage you to go write some irresponsible code and then go teach somebody else to do the same. Um, here is what this looked like when I was trying to work on scroll and I forgot to multiply how many columns I had by two. As it scrolled down, a big green thing started happening. Um, it was really, really funny and just kind of made all this weird glitch art. Um, and so just a lot of people have been really motivated by this Intermezos uh, project. And so when you're also doing these types of things, you can also be motivating these people. There is an audience out there. Even if you don't believe you're an expert in something, there's an audience for the way you explain it. Mm -hmm. And so we had our very first uh, Intermezos workshop um, yesterday, which was super awesome. And a lot of people participated, and that was fantastic. Um, one of the fun things that I wasn't able to show you in your demo is that if you shift the position, by one, uh, it inverts the color codes in the characters, and the color that we use for default is actually the smiley face um, character. So if you messed it up, you just got a bunch of smiley faces, which is honestly what I think is the best. It's like, let's write some terrible code and have it smile at us. It's awesome. Um, so I want to encourage you, contribute to Intermezos. Um, we're only, OK, so last time when I did my first talk on Intermezos, it was nine months old, and I thought that it was kind of like a strange incubation period. So I just said it again. Um, but it's 10 months old now. Um, uh, we've got lots of contributors, and you don't have to just contribute to code to uh, contribute. There's also the book, which also accepts tons of contributors. Um, so we, wanna con we want you to contribute to Intermezos. We think you're great, whoever you are. If you have that nagging feeling in the back of your head saying, oh, I can't write an operating system, tell it that you don't think so. All right, and if someone says, failure to comply will make you look silly, all right, that's awesome. Cool, let's all look silly. So yes, I can operating system and so can you. Thanks.